The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, verse number 1, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Ephaz Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six, six cubits and a span, and he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am, I, am not I a Philistine and ye the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you for your sweet spirit here this morning. God, we're grateful when we get to come to the house of God and you remind us that this is your house and that you are in control. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you would help us. You know the need of every heart in this place today. God, I pray for those that are lost that God, we'd see them born again. I pray for those, God, that are hurting, we'd see a balm of Gilead applied to their soul. God, I pray for those this morning who are struggling, they'd find strength. God, I pray for those who are seeking your will, that it would be manifested very clearly to them. I pray that, Father, we would leave with more than a head knowledge of God. We'd leave with our hearts full of God. Now, God, do a work that only you can do. Use this unworthy vessel this morning. Glorify your namesake. Lord, do a work that is supernatural in our midst. And God, help us to praise you and bless you for how great you really are. Father, we love you. We need you. We long for you. Help us this day. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want you to notice, first of all, the conflict mentioned in the Scriptures. The Bible says in verse number 1, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. Can I help you with something this morning? There is a conflict going on. There is spiritual warfare all around us. Can I say this morning, if you're here and you're saved by the grace of God... Uh, there is a battle going on that will stop you in your tracks, uh, that will impede you, that will hinder you, that will throw you off course, uh, that will put you in a ditch, uh, that will ruin your testimony, that will hinder you from being a light to this dark and depressed world. If you're here today and you're not saved, uh, 
There's a battle for your soul. Uh, uh, the devil has you right where he wants you. He has you in his clutches. Uh, he has you bound by sin. Uh, he wants sin to dominate you. Uh, he wants you to have pleasure in your sin. Uh, he wants you uh, uh, to embrace the darkness all around you. Uh, and on the other side, there's the sweet Holy Ghost of God uh, who doesn't want you to die and go to hell. Uh, who wants to reveal unto you uh, that Jesus shed his blood for your sin, uh, friend, that you don't have to go to hell. Uh, uh, you can be born again. Uh, you can be saved. Uh, your life can be changed today. Uh, uh, you'll find more than pleasure in sin. Uh, you'll find the joy of the Lord for your soul. Uh, you'll find hope. Uh, you'll find peace. Uh, you'll find rest. Uh, the Bible says there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Uh, hey, uh, uh, you'll leave lighter because uh, the heavy burden of sin will be rolled off of you. Uh, there is a battle going on today. There's a conflict. Can I say, I want you to notice the champion in this text. In verse number 4, the Bible says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. And I say, this fellow was more than a man. This man intimidated the whole army of Israel. Can I say this about this man? His mere presence and boldness caused trained men in the conflict of warfare to be afraid. I want you to know something about this champion. Notice his size. The Bible says that he was mm, six cubits and a span tall. Now depending on what a cubit is, you see there are some scholars that teach that a cubit is a foot five inches or 17 inches. There are some that say a cubit could be as much as 23 inches. The standard rule is 18 inches. All I can tell you is this sucker is somewhere between 9 feet 3 inches tall and 11 feet 10 inches tall. He is a huge human being. We see his size. It's intimidating. Can I say the size of your conflict is intimidating? Hmm? If you're here, you're lost. The devil makes you feel like you can't be saved. The devil feels like you've went too far in sin. The devil makes you feel like your sin, you can't give it up. I've got news for you, you can't give it up. But I've got real good news for you. The Lord can take it from you. Whatever it is, He can break the chains. Uh, it may be too big for you, but it's not too big for Him, honey. If you're here today and you're saved, Whatever you're faced with, whatever conflict that is uh, upon you today is much bigger than you. It may feel overwhelming. You may feel like this might be the one you can't get through. Can I help you with something? Jesus went to the wilderness. He was tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, uh, Brother James he went to the wilderness uh, that he might bring you and I through the wilderness no matter what you face he's already conquered it yes. now can I say Miss Cinda whatever your conflict is might not bother me I might look at it as very insignificant but if it's your conflict it may be huge to you mm -mm. One man wrote that you're either in a storm, you just came out of a storm, or you're fixing to go into a storm. I'd like to tell you that Christians don't have problems, but you do. And sometimes your conflicts look huge. They will intimidate you. Can I say I have known men much greater than I that preach this book that face things that was bigger than them. I not only want you to see the size of this champion, I want you to see the strength of this champion. Look what it says about his coat. It says in verse number 5 that he had a helmet of brass upon his head. 
and it said that he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass and he had greaves of brass upon his legs. Those were uh, uh, things that were made of brass to cover his uh, uh, shins. Uh, so if he got hit by a sword in his shins, it didn't cause him to fall. And then it goes on to say uh, 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 that uh, 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 he had a target of brass between his shoulders. On his shoulders, he had a plate that held his sword. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on to say that uh, uh, he had a staff and his spear was like a weaver's beam uh, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. Now let me just put that in perspective with his fellow strength. I mean everything he's wearing is brass and iron and heavy. I mean if he's 11 feet tall he's got you know big armor. But can I say something about his armor, the strength of this man? The coat of mail weighed 156 pounds by itself. 156 pounds is his coat of mail, what he had over his breastplate. Can I say that the spearhead, the head of his spear weighed 19 pounds? Can I say his whole armor combined weighed 750 pounds? I'm talking about this sucker strong. Hmm? Uh, Christian had to work till 7 o'clock this morning. If he's here, he, he can throw up 350 pounds. That's pretty strong. But I'm talking about you walking around with 750 pounds on you. That's strong. And can I say your conflict may be stronger than you. There are folks that I've known that, ha that were addicted to things that just could not kick, you know, kick their addiction. It was stronger than them. Can I say, Jordan, there's folks that are saved that have addictions stronger than them. Mm -mm. Some have addictions to things in a pill bottle, their prescription. Some have addiction to caffeine. Some have addiction to nicotine. Some have addiction to the World Wide Web. Some have addiction to solitaire. Some have addiction to whatever it is. And giving it up may be stronger than you. The strength of this will intimidate you. You know why some people never try? They've already made up in their mind they can't defeat it. We see the size of this champion. We see the strength of this champion. Can I direct your attention to the spear of this champion? The Bible says that his spear was the size of a weaver's beam. I don't know if you've ever been over to Brother Bob, Miss Sonny's house. They have a beautiful place over there on Green Acres. Uh, just down the road is the Whites. They have Arnold the Pig and all the rest of the you know, animals, huh? But if you go up there and you see that loom that Miss Sonny makes them quilts on, but Bob, when I read this, I think of something about the size of that. That's his spear handle with 19 pounds of a spearhead on top of it. Can I say the weapons of our enemy are not only intimidating, they're deadly. Hmm? For the wages of sin is death. We see there's a conflict. We see there's a champion. Notice, if you will, the charge. In verses 8 for 10, this mountain of a man spews blasphemies towards the army of Israel, and he charges a man to come down and fight him. He says, if we defeat you, you'll serve us. If he defeats me and kills me, we'll serve you. There's a charge. There's a line drawn in the sand. Y'all remember, you kids Google this. A fellow by the name of Robert Conrad, he always played a tough guy. And he did them battery commercials. He'd draw a line in the sand, put the battery on his shoulder, and just dare you to knock it off. Hmm? Well, he's daring a man to come and face him. Hmm? He's daring a man. He's charging somebody. Come here. Can I help you with something? The world, the flesh, and the devil charges us every day to face them. Hmm? 
the sorry no good devil will intimidate you every day wanting you to come to battle. Your flesh will rage against you and want you to fight a battle. The old world just dares you to say anything about Jesus. They just dare you. We see the conflict. We see the champion. We see the charge. But notice the cowering. Look with me in verse 11. When Saul, who was head and shoulders taller than anybody in Israel, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They cowered at this intimidating mountain of a man. Can I say too many Christians live in dread? You just live in fear. Now the preacher can stand and preach all day long we ought to live by faith and not by fear. And boy, when you're in church, you get a little faith. You go to the altar, you get a little help, get a little faith. But by Tuesday, the giant's back up. He's beating his fist and intimidating you. Christians live in dread. Can I say this? Christians are discouraged. You live in discouragement. You come to revival meeting, you get a little help, then you face this world, you get back into life and living as you're supposed to, work your job and going to Kroger's and noticing Kroger's uh, prices are going up and their sizes are going smaller. Uh, 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 you go to the uh, 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 stores and you got to wear a mask and you uh, uh, go here and somebody tells you this and traffic's doing this and just living life. You get discouraged. I say too many Christians live defeated. Rather than rush to the house of God ready to worship and praise and exalt the Lord, you find yourself at a crawl just striving to get to the house of God, beat up on, wounded and bleeding and defeated just like the army of Israel, what's the use? The world's too big. My problems are too big. I'm too weak. I can't win the battle. I want to preach with God's help on this thought this morning. How to win the warfare. How to win the warfare. You're in a battle. The whole song service just highlighted how hurt you are. You're hurting. Oh, you got some reassurance, but you're hurting. How are you going to win the warfare? Now, it's easy for me to beat my chest and say, Boy, I've read the back of the book. We win the battle. Hallelujah. We get to go to heaven. But we don't know when that is. You know, we love singing about sweet by and by, but we live in the nasty now and now. We're facing giants. We're facing obstacles. We're hurting. How do we win the warfare till we get to glory? Nowhere in the Bible does God expect His children to be a beat up, bloody, defeated mess till we get to heaven. He didn't save you just to go to heaven. He saved you to give you victory now. He saved you to give you peace now. He saved you to give you joy now. He saved you to be a light, to be a witness, uh, uh, to show the world and show others that are seeking for help. Uh, there is an answer and His name is Jesus. But when the world looks at most Christians, they don't see anything any different than what they have. A life of problems and defeat. So how are you going to win the world warfare? Can I help you with something? The Bible, 111 times in your King James Bible, you'll find the word fight. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. 
Everybody around you knows you go to church and knows you're saved. Lucas, every one of your ball pl uh, teammates, they know you go to church. Hmm? Everybody knows you go to church. Your whole school, classroom, both of them know you go to church because they come with you. <laughs> every one of your co-workers, your schoolmates, your family, even your neighbors know you go to church. You have professed before many witnesses you go to church. Sure. But are you fighting the good fight of faith? Hello. Can I say the Bible tells us that our warfare is not with flesh and blood. Right. We fight spiritual wickedness in high places. Right. And our enemy does not fight fair. Right. But God told us to fight a good fight of faith. He didn't say cower in fear. He said, fight a good fight. The Apostle Paul said this before he went to glory. Uh, in uh, first, Second Timothy 4, uh, verse 7, my granddaddy, uh, uh, the last message I heard him preach, he preached out of this text. Uh, he said, I fought a good fight. Paul didn't say I fought a perfect fight. He didn't say I fought greatly in the fight. Uh, he said I fought a good fight. Uh, I finished my course. Uh, I kept the faith. Sounds like he fought a good fight of faith. Uh, he said henceforth uh, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Uh, but he didn't stop there. Uh, he went on to say which the Lord, the righteous judge, uh, shall give me at that day, not to me only, uh, but unto all them also uh, 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 that love is appearing yeah. the you can win the warfare Amen. but can I help you something you got to get in the fight Amen. you'll never win the warfare sitting on the sidelines licking your wounds right. you'll never win the warfare hiding behind King Saul afraid of the giant Let me give you some things about fighting. I want you to notice, first of all, the hindrances to fighting. You know, you got guys like Michael Jackson. He'll tell you he's a lover, not a fighter. Huh? I heard that, Miss Snorthead. Brother, he's here. <laughs> Maybe he's a fighter, not a lover. I was trying to be, he's a pretty boy. I was trying to be good. That was funny, Miss Lisa. Porky Pig couldn't have done it any better. <laughs> Ooh. Huh? She got some splaining to do on that one, doesn't she? Huh? Can I say Christian people by nature, we're not ugly. Christian people by nature are loving, are kind, are gentle. Those are all fruits of the Spirit. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be forgiving. We're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves. Christian people, generally, we don't think we're to be in a fight. Again, we're not to fight with each other. We're to show each other love and kindness and gentleness and goodness and mercy. That's what Christian people do with other people. But again, our warfare is not with people. We've got to fight. There's too much at stake. These young people are saying, look at these boys. Isn't this a beautiful sight? Amen. Seeing a pew full of young men with their Bibles open, Amen. sitting on the front row. If we throw in the towel, what kind of church are they going to have in 10 years? But there are hindrances to fighting because of our good nature, because of our gentleness and kindness and forgiving spirit that we have we don't want to fight unless your name's Foster but we fight for the wrong reasons as Fosters you look at us cross-eyed we're ready to fight that's not a good thing because our fight's not with people but there are hindrances to our fighting first of all there is the self-worthlessness you don't get in the fight because you don't think you can fight. You don't think you're strong enough. You don't think you know enough of the Bible. You don't think you're a good enough Christian. Uh, you've let the giant the, intimidate you to where you think you are useless. I've got good news. You're not useless. 
You've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Uh, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, you are of a royal priesthood. Uh, you are of a chosen generation. Uh, he that lives in you can propel you over you if you'll let him. We'll let the giant intimidate us to make us feel like we can't take on the giant. Sinner friend, the devil has intimidated you to think you can't get born again. Brother Luther, who we was hoping here today, who gave us this towel, Brother Luther was a sniper in Vietnam. I've never really talked to him about it much. I don't know how many men he killed. I don't know how much he was involved in, in, in slaying people over there. I know a lot of men that came back from Vietnam. They don't like to talk about things they seen, things they witnessed, things that they were involved in. But I know when Luther came home, uh, his darling wife, Miss Nancy, had gotten saved. Uh, she kept telling him about Jesus. He'd go to church with her some, uh, but he didn't really think God could save him. Uh, he thought he'd kill too many people he'd been too wicked he'd been too bad there was no way God could forgive him there was no way God could have mercy on him but one day hallelujah he went to church and Jesus got bigger than his giant and that day he got born again and Luther today still says he can't believe he really gets to go to heaven but he does because Jesus was bigger than his giant Sinner friend, I don't care what it is. Jesus can deliver you. Christian friend, I don't care what it is. You have a promise in the Word of God. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. There's a hindrance to fighting self-worthlessness. The size of the enemy. We just think he's too big. Then there's the sound of the enemy. Can I help you something? The Bible says be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. Can I say the lion's the king of the jungle because of his roar. His roar is so impressive and so loud, every other animal in the, giant, in the jungle is afraid of him. But the lion's not the toughest animal in the jungle. But he sure does sound like it. And can I tell you, the devil sure does sound loud. He does roar. But notice that verse over there in 1 Peter doesn't say, your adversary as a devouring lion seeketh to devour you. All he can do is roar. Can I help you something? The blood of Jesus pulled out all his teeth. Uh he can't devour you. He just intimidates you with his sound. What can I say? He'll whisper in your ear how useless and how sorry and how much greater he is than you. But see, there's a still small voice inside of you. If you'd learn to listen to it, you'll find it's a whole lot better and a whole lot stronger than the voice of the enemy. There's hindrances to fighting. Can I say, secondly, there's the horror of fighting. Again, we don't like to fight. We'd rather talk our way out of it. But unfortunately, that's what most Christians are. Too much talk, not enough action. They talk a good fight, but there's no evidence. Can I say, there's the fear of losing. A lot of people don't fight because they're afraid they're going to lose. They don't get involved because they're afraid they're going to make a mess of it. Huh? I understand not wanting to lose. Can I say most people that have ever been successful at anything were far too many times a failure before they became a success. They just kept fighting. You know, Abraham Lincoln was an utter failure in everything he did. He was. Even his law firm filed bankruptcy. Every election he ever ran for, from a local level to state level, he lost. The only thing that he ever won at was the presidency. And can you imagine what this country would have been like if Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have been in the White House during those years? Hmm. I'm trying to help you with something. 
you may take a few steps backwards, take a few lumps, you may take a few defeats, but you're never going to win unless you start fighting. Mm. The horror of fighting is the fear of losing or the fear of loss. What's it going to cost me? You're not afraid to lose, you're afraid of what you may lose. See, if you start living for Jesus, you might lose some of your friends on the job. You start living for Jesus and you might lose some of them things you're addicted to that's taken up a lot of your time and effort. You start living for Jesus, it might cost you a little bit of money in your pocketbook to support missions or something. I don't if you start what's it going to cost me? Let me help you with something. Anything you sacrifice for fighting for Jesus, it's well worth it, and he'll far, far, far bless you far beyond whatever it costs you. There's the fear of losing. There's the fear of loss. But there's also the fears of letting others down. By nature, we don't want to let anybody else down. Paul said, lest when I preach to others and I myself become a castaway. No one ever wants to let anybody else down. But by not fighting, you're letting Jesus down. There's the hindrances to fighting, the horror of fighting. Then there's the hardship of fighting. Can I say, first of all, it's hard to stand. I didn't say it was hard to stand up. Most Christians, when they're pushed far enough, they'll stand up for Jesus. But it's hard to just stand. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us in verse number 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. We like the armor. Hey, the giant had armor. We got armor. He gives us what the armor of God is. He says that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, verse 14, he says, stand therefore. Our problem is when we make up our mind we're going to get in a fight, we want to engage. We want to pull out that sword and start a swinging. God just says, you stand. The hardest thing to do in fighting is just to stand. Just to link arm in arm with one another and stand. Take every blow that the enemy throws at you and stand. Don't step backwards. Don't step forward. Just stand. Why? Because God's going to do the fighting. But he won't fight till we stand. And if we step backwards, he doesn't fight. If we step forward and get in front of him, he don't fight. He says, stand. I don't know if you've seen some of these videos of some of these Black Lives Matter movement getting in the face of police officers. There was one on a courthouse in Los Angeles, and this person was nose to nose with this police officer. And by the way, the police officer was black nose to nose with the police officer cussing him calling him everything in the world and all the police officer could do was stand you know how much respect and integrity I have for that man they can Biden can say all day long we need to train them more so they shoot people in the leg I'm telling you somebody's shooting at me I'm shooting at him and I'm not shooting at the leg hmm but I'm here to tell you what training that they have put these men through that when they're being cussed and spit upon and told vile things to and everything degraded and they just stand. That speaks volume of their character. That speaks honor to the badge pinned to their chest. And when you and I stand when all the spewing of all the filth of the world and the flesh and the devil keeps impacting and keeps throwing itself at us uh, and keeps berating us uh, and we stand, uh, we bring honor to the badge of Christianity. Amen. But it's hard to stand. Because we want to give it back to them. And God just says, stand. Take every blow. Stand. Uh, in Exodus 14, 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, 
and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who you've seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It's hard to stand. Can I say this? It's hard to sustain. Boy, during revival meeting. Boy, during your daily Bible reading and God shows you a verse. And then you get on the job. Somebody cut you off in traffic. You need some eggs and milk. And Kroger said, you can't come in without a mask. Go get a pizza. And you're going to sit from here to Clint. You've got to put a mask on to come in. Then you can take it off and you sit down there. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. This coronavirus is so smart, it only attacks at the door. The drive throughs They have you put the money in a little container, then they take it out, put it in the cash and put money back. That, it, it dies in the container. What an amazing, <laughs> wonderful solution to this virus. Sustaining your stand. Whether it's raining, storming, thundering, lightning, whether the waves of adversity are crashing against you, he says, stand. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 2, 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just sustain it. Just endure it. Amen. Just endure it. Amen. Just keep standing. Just endure it. It's hard. Not easy. Hmm? Not easy, Aiden, when you're going to be on a court and somebody elbows you. You're going to want to go down to the other court and give back to them. Huh? Here's how you do it. Stand up. When the ball's being shot, go, boom, like you're getting a rebound. <laughs> then you don't get called for a foul, and if it's not a foul, then, then you're not guilty, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> huh? I was shocked little Fred can play. I was watching him last night. He could play until he got mad. Huh? Got a little mad. Got a little, little Jones come out of him. And then got a little whiny. Huh? A little, a little vining come out in him. No, he didn't. He didn't. He played good. I was shocked. Little Fred can handle the ball. Huh? But no, sustaining it. Enduring. Huh? Taking a licking. Keep on ticking. Not easy. It's hard to stand. It's hard to sustain it. And it's hard to suffer. We like them promises where we don't have to suffer. We like the glory. We like the praise part of it. We like the rewards. We don't like the suffering. The sad reality is there are no battles without brokenness Amen. but we have a promise he's nigh them of a broken heart and save us such of a contrite spirit some of the greatest greatest thrills and times in your Christian life come through brokenness because then God becomes more real than you ever knew he could be we've seen the hardship of fighting but I've got good news. You've got a helper in the fight. Oh, yeah. You see, you have the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. He said in Hebrews 13, 5, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. You never fight alone. You never go to a battle without the already having the one who's going to win it for you, with you. Uh, you never, ever, ever are standing there alone. Right. Remember Sidney Weaver talking about standing a post when he was in the Navy. He had to wait till uh, 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 his command came and relieved him of duty. But I've got news for you. When you're standing your post, you're not there alone. The commander's always with you. Can I say? You know, we got a helper in the fight. We have the son, but we got more than that. 
We got the Spirit of God. The Bible says in Judges 14, 19, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, Samson, and he went down to Ascalon uh, and slew 30 men of them. Uh, how could he win the battle? He had the Spirit of God fighting for him. huh? You got the Son. You got the Spirit. But I got more good news. You also got the sword of the Spirit. The Bible says over in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 10, talking about David, uh, said he arose, uh, smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, uh, and his hand clave unto the sword, uh, and the Lord wrought a, wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Can I help you with something while you're sustaining, while you're standing, uh, while you're suffering? Uh, you've got a sword. You've got the Word of God that will equip you and even help elevate you. Amen. Why you are standing. We're going to help her in the fight. Oh, there's hindrances. Yeah, there's hardships. But you've got to help her. And then lastly... And where the rubber meets the road, do you have a heart to fight? You know, I'm old, I ain't much, but I love Jesus enough I'm still willing to get in a fight. Amen. Do you have a heart to fight? And I say it takes courage to fight. In this day and age, to give out a gospel tract, to tell somebody about Jesus, to tell your co-worker about Jesus, and then show up every day and live for Jesus in front of them, that takes courage. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. You can take courage in the Lord, friend. Oh, in your own abilities, there's not much to be confident about. Because you know, by the grace of God, you are what you are. You know you fail Him every day. You know how frail your flesh is. You know how weak you really are when it comes to knowing the whole counsel of the Word of God. But don't put confidence in yourself. Be of good courage. You can put confidence in Him. He's already in the fire waiting on you, friend. Hmm? To have a heart to fight, to be in the fight, takes courage. takes commitment. During the revival meeting, it's easy to make commitment. But see, every day you've got to get up and put your boots on. Every day you've got to make up your mind, I'm going to stand for God today. Every day you're going to make up, I'm going to endure today. Every day I'm going to face this mountain today. Every day, you're going to have to stand up and be counted for. But then it takes a cause. Look with me then at verse 26 of our text. Now keep in mind, where we left off, the whole army of Israel is cowering behind Saul. Well, there's some boys up there on that mountain whose dad was worried about them, sent the youngest boy who'd been tending the sheep down there with some supplies, taking some bread, some cheese or something. He gets down there and he hears this uncircumcised Philistine. Look at verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to this man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Why wasn't he angry against the giant? This is the older brother, David. Why wasn't he out there fighting this giant? No, he gets mad at the little snot-nosed brother. Huh? Seth, it's like you getting mad at Owen. Why don't you just be a man and no one to take care of himself? Huh? Look what he says. Why camest thou down hither? Well, he came because his daddy sent him to send him some food. Huh? Then he says this, And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Well, don't worry about it. He was made sure the sheep were taken care of. You quit worrying about David. Worry about the giant, big boy. Huh? He said, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. No, he didn't. The Bible said David was a man after God's own heart. David wasn't full of pride. Huh? He was full of fight, though. Yep. Hmm. Huh? Goes on and says, For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. 
Now look what the Bible said in verse 29. And David says, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause to fight? You children in here got saved this summer during the revival meetings. Raise your hand. Now, better than that, stand up. Stand up if you got saved this summer. Stand up. Look at them. Look at them. Look at them. Is there not a cause? How many more little Sammies are out there? Huh? You can sit down, guys. Thank you. Huh? How many more are out there? Is there not a cause? Huh? I'm glad somebody was standing in the wall. Somebody was a fighting. Somebody was enduring. Somebody was taking some heat and taking some battles, uh, facing some giants, uh, ignoring the spews and the lies and all the intimidation of the giants. They just kept standing. Uh, and God did a work around here. Is there not a cause? Listen. Christians are never to run from the fight. Now. Nowhere does it say in the Bible that we need to be with a bullhorn trying to cause a fight. I got news for you. If you do that, the Lord's going to let you fight by yourself. And you're no match for the devil. We're never to cause one, but we're never to run from one. Can I say this? Nowhere in the Bible are Christians supposed to retreat in the fight. They're supposed to stand. And nowhere in the Bible are Christians to relinquish gain, ground that has been gained in the fight. You know, too many churches are changing midstream. Changing what they believe. Changing how they worship. Changing what Bible they use. Changing, we're not to relinquish any ground that we've won. We're just to fight. So I wonder today. You ready to start winning your warfare? It starts with seeing a cause, making a commitment to God, and just standing your ground. You ready to get in a fight? A lot at stake. You ready to start winning now and then for all of eternity? You can win. You can win your warfare, but you've got to get in a fight. You ready to get in a fight? You ready to quit letting your giant intimidate you and start letting God equip you and overcome your giant? You ready to give it to God? You ready to lay it down and say, God, this thing's too big for me. Here it is. And God, by your help, by your grace, I'm just going to stand. I'm going to sustain. I'm just going to do everything you'd have me to do, Lord. If I have to suffer, I'm going to suffer. But God, I'm expecting you to be in the midst of my fight. You ready to do that today? Lost person, you tired of being lost? You tired of your sin holding you captive? You tired of feeling no hope? And you tired of knowing that if you died today, you're going to spend eternity in hell? Are you tired of that? Do you want some hope? you want some joy? you want some life? you want some peace? you want some rest? Well, it's about time you told your giant you're, you're turning from that and you're going to turn to Jesus. Amen. Friend, what have you got to lose? Yeah. Why don't you just give Jesus a try? Yeah. Right. See if he's not greater than your problems. Why don't you give him your heart? You've done a terrible job with it thus far. Why don't you give it to him and let him change your life. Let him be your giant. Because, oh, there's nothing like Jesus. Amen. Too many of you Christians have been beat up on too long. Why don't you just get in the fight? Why don't you say, I'm not much, but Jesus is, and just make much of Jesus. Amen. He'll take care of your giants and your problems. You tired? Amen. Why don't you just get in the fight today? Sinner friend, why don't you get saved today? Why don't you come? Let us take the Bible, show you how to be saved. You, you probably even know how to save. Just call on the Lord. He'll save you, friend. Just turn to Him. Let Him save you. He'll save you today. Are you willing to get saved? Get rid of that giant? Are you tired of Him just beating you up and wearing you out? Why don't you just let the Lord have your life? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. Christopher Finn, why don't you let the Lord slay your giant? Maybe some sinners to get saved today. Huh? You ready to get in a fight? You ready to let him have it? Hmm?
He's greater than whatever it is you're facing. Just let him have it. Sinner friend, you're tired of being lost? Today might be your day. Why don't you come? Get born again. Folks are coming. There's a place for you. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you're greater than our giants. I'm glad you, you took our cross. You paid for our sin. You defeated our death, hell, and the grave. And Lord, you died that we might have life. And through you, we have victory. We have hope. We have joy. And God, I pray for your people that have been too long listening to the devil. I pray today that get in a fight, get some hope, get some strength. Lord, I pray you do a work in their life. God, I pray for the sinners that are in here today. Lord, their sin has held them captive. I pray today they'll turn from it, turn to Jesus, and Jesus would save them. God, do a work here now. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.